spring, in the backcountry surrounding Yellowstone National Park, a lone visitor made a gruesome discovery. A severed head, coarsely hacked off at the neck. Spread out over the forest floor were the victim's other extremities, but the bulk of the body was gone. What made this macabre scene doubly bizarre is that the remains didn't belong to a human victim, but to one of North America's largest and most powerful predators, a fully grown black bear. Over the next 15 years, three more deaths would follow, all connected, all pointing to a larger mystery, one that would change the way we look at these animals forever. Yellowstone is one of the largest national parks in the United States. It is a mountain fortress, a craggy wilderness based around a huge dormant volcano, 48 kilometers wide and 72 kilometers long. It is part of a large area called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, one of the last truly wild places left in the US. Every year, millions of tourists experience the spectacular scenery. Yet there are places here where humans rarely set foot. The forces remain powerful and primal. It was here that biologist Dr. David Matson unearthed remains that should shed new light on the behavior of bears in Yellowstone. Matson was studying grizzly bears, investigating some unusual activity in a place called Hoodoo Creek. Hoodoo Creek is a, a narrow, steep drainage that's very difficult to get around in. A steep-sided forest, rapidly narrowing as it descended, it's a place that immediately made Matson nervous. It's the kind of place that just intrinsically leaves you feeling ill at ease because there's not much of an easy way to get out once you get in. Matson knew that Hoodoo Creek was rife with bear activity, and bears are David Matson's business. As soon as he reached the bottom of the valley, he knew that something was wrong. There was the stench of death. A, an incredibly distinctive kind of odor, almost a palpable, thick odor. Matson tracked the smell to its source. And that's when he saw it. Lying on the forest floor was a severed paw. It was sheared off just above the wrist. From the size, Matson could tell it came from a large bear. The short claws meant it was a black bear. But where was the rest of it? No other remains were visible. Matson had spent most of his working life studying bears. In spite of the dangers, he pressed on. Three hundred meters away, deeper into the drainage, he made another strange discovery. There was a severed 
black bear's head. The body was nowhere to be seen. The bear's head was perched on a pile of debris, surrounded by sticks and dirt, almost like a display. One of the most macabre things I've ever seen. The removal of the head and paws were the sort of things a big game hunter might do. But what sort of hunter would leave the most obvious trophies and make off with the body? There was only one logical answer. A hunter that wanted to eat it. The death at Hoodoo Creek in 1990 was the first of its kind ever recorded in Yellowstone. But it wasn't the last. The second case occurred eight years later, 65 kilometers across the park. Tourists reported seeing what looked like a dead bear at Grizzly Overlook. Biologist Kerry Gunter was sent in to investigate. On the morning of August 2nd, I got a call from the Canyon Visitor Center, and they had some park visitors there that were uh, looking for grizzly bears out in Hayden Valley. And at one pullout we call Grizzly Overlook, they noticed a black bear laying in the sagebrush. It was obviously dead. Unlike the first corpse, this time much of the body was intact but there was a grotesque twist. The bear's penis had been removed. It was left lying next to the corpse. There were teeth marks at the base. It had been bitten off. Gunther knew that this victim needed to be sent to a specialist. One hundred and sixty kilometers away in Bozeman, Montana, the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks runs a pathology lab. Here, they're equipped to deal with any mysterious deaths found in the Yellowstone area. Ready? Yep. They intended to study the carcass more thoroughly to discover not only how it was killed, but why. Nearly 90 kilograms of dead bear and a whole load of questions. The man called upon to carry out the examination was biologist Neil Anderson. Normally when we receive an animal, we try to distance ourselves from what was reported to us prior to getting the bear. 195.5 pounds. Anderson and his team took nothing for granted. We base our conclusions solely on the evidence that we observe while we're doing the examination. Width of the back foot, four and three quarters. The measurements confirmed that this was an adult male. 61 inches. Measuring one and a half meters from head to tail. And the victim of a powerful and violent attack. Seems to be a lot of trauma to the head. Several possible puncture wounds. Just as Gunther had described, the carcass had been partly consumed. Um, appears to be some tissue removed from the hindquarters. And the genitals bitten off. Strangely, it was this grotesque element that would be the biggest clue to the identity of the killer. Two black bears killed in Greater Yellowstone, both in very unusual circumstances. The team investigating the Grizzly Overlook case began a thorough inquiry. Leader of the bear study team was Dr. Charles Schwartz. When we come across a kill like this, or when we come across a dead bear, to a large degree we're doing investigations. We're trying to take all of the evidence that we can find to try to come to some conclusion of what might have happened to this bear. With a team of only about two dozen scientists, covering such a huge and hostile area of land is no easy task. Situated in the Northern Rockies, in the heart of the American West, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is 73,000 square kilometers of true wilderness. 
about the size of West Virginia. Made up of mountains, meadows, forests, rivers and plains, it is the only place in the US where all of North America's large predators can still be found. Could one of them have killed the black bears at Hoodoo Creek and Grizzly Overlook? Solitary cougars prowl the mountains. Packs of wolves roam the plains. Coyotes stalk the meadows. Ferocious wolverines lurk and scavenge everywhere. All of these predators coexist alongside the bears. But which is powerful enough to take down and kill a 90 kilogram predator? It's probably very rare that the event would have taken place by a cougar. Cougars tend not to be um, predators of other large carnivores. A wolverine, although incredibly aggressive, is no match for a black bear up to 10 times its size. There were packs of coyotes in the area, but the signs on the corpse did not match those of a coyote attack. But what about wolves working in a pack? Wolves have been known to attack bears, charging in, biting at the bear's sides and hindquarters. But they tend to pick on smaller individuals. And as far as the researchers could tell, the nearest wolves were many kilometers away from Grizzly Overlook. I didn't think wolves had killed this black bear. Uh, wolves had only recently been reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park and they hadn't recolonized Hayden Valley. We didn't have any known wolf pack living in Hayden Valley. That left only one creature capable of inflicting these injuries on an animal this big and this strong. Another bear. Could the black bear at Grizzly Overlook have been the victim of an attack by another black bear? Black bears are very adaptable animals that prefer to live in and around the forest. They are formidable predators, capable of inflicting severe injury by one blow of their powerful paws or a bite from their well-armed jaws. They measure nearly one meter at the shoulder and two meters when standing. They weigh up to 225 kilograms. The removal of the penis from the grizzly overlook bear is the big clue. When large males fight, they often attack this area of the body. Whether it is to prevent their opponents breeding or just to hit them where it hurts is unknown. But Greater Yellowstone has two types of bear. The victims at Grizzly Overlook and Hoodoo Creek were both black bears. But Yellowstone is also home to the less common grizzly bear. Grizzlies are powerful and formidable carnivores. They have bone-crushing jaws and 10-centimeter claws used when attacking and holding down prey. They have a distinct shoulder hump due to the large muscles necessary for digging up roots and turning over boulders. A fully grown grizzly can reach up to two and a half meters when standing. It's one of the largest land predators in the world, twice the weight of a black bear. It's the top predator in Yellowstone. Investigators in the Grizzly Overlook case were down to a short list of two suspects. But which one did it? We started looking for evidence that might point us in a direction or give us some clues anyway as to whether it was a, another black bear or a grizzly. And we start skinning it. The skin of a bear is up to five millimeters thick and the addition of fur made accurate analysis of the wounds very difficult. To examine it properly, Laboratory Supervisor Neil Anderson carried out a necropsy, an animal autopsy. Basically, if you look at tissue in a live animal, if it's traumatized in any way, there's a rush of blood to that tissue, which causes bruising or a hematoma. And this animal had certainly been traumatized. And the skull of the bear had multiple bite wounds and was crushed. There was actually chips of bones that you could 
feel and wiggle. The evidence in the lab backed up Gunter's observations. A lot of, a lot of tissue damage here. Bite wounds have penetrated the skull and shattered the cheekbone. Bone fragments were missing. Observed around the head, throat and abdominal areas were multiple puncture wounds. Associated with the punctures where hematomas are bruising, that to us indicated that the punctures occurred while the animal was alive. But there were so many puncture wounds, it made it difficult to see which bite was which. I'd say that those are probably from upper canines. Then Anderson got a lucky break. There's a couple puncture wounds here that look like they could be set from a single bite. He found two distinct puncture marks on the right side of the face, just under the lower jawbone. Wounds that had been invisible before he removed the hide. Based on the damage, I'd say that's probably the killing blow. A matching pair of canines. Measuring the distance between these two holes might just identify whose teeth had done the biting. 59 millimeters. Anderson had the measurement he was after. The holes were about six and a half centimeters apart. Now it was only a matter of finding the teeth that matched the spacing. We have reference skulls in our lab, and we measured a large number of different skulls, black bears, wolves, grizzly bears, mountain lions, and really the only animal that had that distance between the lower canines was a grizzly bear. It seemed that the team had overwhelming evidence that their killer was the grizzly. The removal of the penis, the shattered skull, canine puncture marks, and bruising under the skin all added up to one conclusion. If you look at the preponderance of evidence, it leads us to conclude that he had been killed and eaten by a grizzly bear. But this didn't solve the mystery. In 60 years of research, there had never been a documented case of grizzly on black bear aggression in Yellowstone. And yet there had been another unusual death, the one at Hoodoo Creek. Was that also the result of a grizzly attack? Ahead lay seasons of uncertainty. The black bear killing at Hoodoo Creek seemed very different to the one at Grizzly Overlook. But could a grizzly be responsible for that death too? Biologist Dr. David Matson certainly thought so. The size of the tracks nailed it as an adult male grizzly bear because no other bear has a track that large. And so this black bear had been at least fed on by the grizzly bear and probably killed. The good tracking conditions meant Matson could piece together the circumstances surrounding the death. The soil was really loose, and so we were able to then backtrack and reconstruct what had actually happened. And in fact, determine that the grizzly bear had killed the black bear and just exactly how he had done it as well. The grizzly was moving along the valley bottom, hidden from the black bear grazing higher up. I would guess as soon as it saw the black bear, it, it lunged forward instinctively. It is likely that as soon as the male grizzly attacked, the black bear dived off and attempted to make her escape. She got about 90 meters, then lapped up a fire-blackened pine tree. And apparently she didn't get very far because what we saw were the rakes of her claws as she was drug off the tree by the grizzly bear. She escaped again. About 14 meters later, she jumped up another pine, only to be dragged off once more. And then just 10 yards below that, um, we could see where they had tumbled on down and the grizzly bear had, uh, had killed her. Two black bears killed by two different grizzlies. What was the motive? When any animal enters the realm of a predator, it must know how it's going to escape. 
For black bears, the best way is to climb the nearest tree. But the black bear at Grizzly Overlook had ventured too far from the forest and left itself no chance of reaching safety. It was a fatal mistake. He had left the safety of the forest and entered the domain of the grizzly. Investigators had the first concrete evidence of grizzly on black bear aggression in Greater Yellowstone. But if the two species were aggressive towards each other, then how had they managed to coexist in Yellowstone? The answer seemed to be that they used the environment in very different ways. The behavioral tendencies of black bears and grizzly bears are quite different. And it has a lot to do with uh, the kind of world they evolved in. Black bears evolved in North America, south of the ice sheets during the Ice Age. Whereas grizzly bears are essentially a species of Europe and Asia. They evolved primarily on the Siberian plains. Grizzly bears evolved on the tundra. Black bears evolved in the forest. And it wasn't until about 11,000 years ago when the ice sheets receded that black bears moved north and grizzly bears moved south. And then the two species coexisted together. In Yellowstone, the two species of bears generally stuck to the habitats they were used to. Grizzly bears tend to use open environments, meadows, willow bottoms near rivers. Black bears, on the other hand, tend to confine themselves to the more forested habitats. So what was it that was bringing them together? The grizzly bear study team has spent the last 25 years capturing bears, fitting them with collars and monitoring them. These collars are equipped with GPS devices which use satellites to track the bears every move. But in such mountainous terrain, it is very difficult to receive the radio signals emitted by the collars. The team has to take to the air. Once a week, we can go out in an airplane and the collar then will turn on and transmit the information to our computer. Shannon Padrizny is one of the team of ecologists tracking Yellowstone's collared bears. She's patrolled these 1,200 square kilometers of wilderness for 10 years. The study that we're doing is to look at the differences in habitat use between black and grizzly bears. Until collaring work began, the team knew little of how bears coexisted in Yellowstone. We have members of both species radio collared, and I fly every week and upload the data. The GPS data she uploads tells Padrizny where the bears have been, at what time, and whether they have come into contact with other bears. But one routine flight led to something else entirely. The attacks at Hoodoo Creek and Grizzly Overlook occurred when black bears strayed out of their territory and into the path of a grizzly. They were just simple opportunism, but this one would be very different. Somewhere in this vast expanse, one of the collared black bears had stopped moving. Her collar was on mortality signal and the uploaded data indicated that she had not moved in several days. The only time a bear would stay still for that long is during winter hibernation. But this was autumn, when the bears are at their most active. Something was very wrong. The activity sensor in the collar registered zero. But there was nothing Podrizny could do from the air. Someone would have to go in on foot. The man chosen to investigate was wildlife technician Craig Whitman. Whitman knew this bear already. In fact, he had collared her just two weeks earlier. Black bear 22048, a female between 20 to 22 years. 
She weighed 178 pounds, which is a really good body weight and was in good health at capture. Um, she had good body fat. She was still agile. When he left her, she had been fit and well, but now she had stopped moving. The coordinates he had been given, a location near Dave Adams Hill, was quite a distance from where he had last seen her. She had obviously been moving higher up into the forest in search of food to fatten up for the winter. But this was her last journey. So the scene we came upon, there was a, a large, a large intestine and stomach buried in that pile. The body parts were strewn throughout the forest. So, you know, we, we find her intestine, her stomach. Whitman had been with this female just two weeks ago, and now bits of her body were scattered amongst the trees. He knew he had to find and catalog all that remained. We got basically almost the whole hide and the whole skeleton. Photos from the scene of the kill show the skull, the limbs, and the spine spread out over three different locations. The hide was inverted out over the head right out over the skull. Actually, ears were pulled through and inverted. Although the skin was still attached, it had been pulled inside out. Her legs were disarticulated from the spine, but they were still attached to the hide, so the hide was inverted down over to the wrist, um, just kind of like you take a sweater off. Whitman saw all the signs of a grizzly attack, but it was right in the heart of black bear territory. This could only mean that the grizzlies were using the same part of the forest. We had really good bite marks on the neck, on the face. These shots show the inverted skin of the head and the canine puncture marks. And we were able to find grizzly bear hairs where the bear had uh, brushed hairs off on sticks. The inverted hide. The bite marks and the grizzly hair left at the scene led to only one conclusion. A third grizzly bear attack. And this one offered much clearer evidence of what happened after the kill. The black bear had been skinned, dismembered and scattered. Why? Although their diet consists of up to 80% meat, the grizzlies in Yellowstone are actually omnivores. The rest of their diet is vegetation. If you look at a bear's teeth, they're very similar to a human's, at least as far as the molars are concerned. They're fairly flat, they have cusps to them, and they're not designed to cut flesh. They're designed to grind and to crush. That leaves the grizzlies with a problem if they want to get to the meat of their prey. Generally what you'll find is that they have a tendency to peel the hide off. I guess the best analogy would be somewhat similar to peeling a banana. The hide of the black bear at Dave Adams Hill had been peeled back so the grizzly could get to the meat. When a grizzly bear makes a kill, it eats as much as it can, consuming up to a quarter of its own body weight in one go but a black bear is half the weight of a grizzly bear, twice as much as it can manage. So the grizzly has learned to hide the remainder somewhere safe. It scratches a shallow trench in the earth and covers the remains of its prey with sticks and dirt. The behavior is known as caching. Partly buried, the meat is kept free from flies or away from scavengers who might steal the bear's spoils. Until it regains its appetite, the bear guards the cache protectively. Even dragging the carcass from one cache site to another and reburying it to make sure it stays safe. 
when the bears cache a carcass like that, they'll go out two or three meters out and they'll dig the dirt and vegetation, pine needles in, and bring it all into a big pile. That's exactly what happened to Black Bear 22048. She had been cached twice by another bear and then drug off another 10 or 15 feet and the carcass had been dispersed. At Hoodoo Creek, Matson too discovered buried remains. But why hadn't caching occurred in the Grizzly Overlook case? It was only a couple hundred meters from the road, and so when traffic came along in the morning, I believe that probably scared the grizzly bear off, and that's why it only uh, scavenged one quarter of the black bear. Three black bears killed, all by grizzly bears. Researchers now had concrete evidence that grizzlies in Yellowstone were attacking black bears. And they knew what occurred once the kills had been made. But an important mystery remained. It was one thing for grizzlies to attack and kill when they happened upon a black bear. But the third kill at Dave Adams Hill occurred deep within black bear territory. What was the grizzly doing there? The scientists had to compare the cases once again. The corpse at Hoodoo Creek was found in the spring. The body at Grizzly Overlook during the height of summer. But the carcass at Dave Adams Hill was discovered with autumn looming, when bears are hastily trying to find as much fattening food as possible before six months fasting during hibernation. So, did the grizzly at Dave Adams Hill go into the forest to hunt down and kill a black bear in order to fatten up on meat? Meat is a much higher quality food, and when bears can get it, they'll choose meat over vegetation in most cases. However, there was another possible reason why the grizzly had entered the forest. Examining the stomach contents of the black bear, the researchers discovered it had been voraciously feeding on white bark pine cones. You know, in the fall, bears are just looking to put on weight, and they're looking for the, the, the highest calorie diet that they can get to put weight on to carry them through the winter. Um, in this case, she was feeding on uh, white bark pine seeds, which are mostly fat. Scientists were finding that this energy-rich food source is a potentially crucial part of both black and grizzly bears' diets. And it seemed that was what the black bear at Dave Adams Hill had been doing when she was killed. She had about half a gallon of these seeds in her stomach. And these seeds were the reason grizzlies were in black bear territory. The most likely scenario was that the grizzly went into the forest to search for white bark pine cones, came across black bear 22048, killed her, and ate her. The discovery revealed how important the forests are not only to the black bears, but also to the grizzlies, normally associated with the open plains. Perhaps there was more habitat overlap than was originally thought. Even though black bears and grizzly bears evolved in different environments, it turns out that we see black bears eating a lot of the same foods that grizzly bears do. It begs the question of how the black bears then manage to live in the same environment that the grizzly bears live in. And I think, for the most part, black bears do that by figuring out how to avoid grizzly bears, having some sense of where and when they will likely find grizzly bears and not being there. Both species will go where there are common food sources, but they avoid each other by being there at different times. If they get it wrong, the outcome can be fatal. In the case of Hoodoo Creek, the black bear hadn't worked out where and when the grizzly would be there. This was because the environment had recently changed. The forest had been blackened by fires two years earlier, but its regeneration had led to an unexpected profusion of highly nutritious food sought after by both species of bear. 
Hoodoo Creek had been burned by the fires of 1988, which went through quick and hot, but left most of the trees standing and blackened. The U.S. Forest Service had gone in and aerially seeded the drainage with clover and grasses. It had been converted from a relatively poor foraging environment for bears to a particularly rich one. So there were bears there in great numbers focused on grazing clover. Having not yet figured out all of the dynamics of who was where when, which I think also then contributed to the vulnerability of that black bear and why she got caught where she did. Although the three cases had seemed very different, they were actually all about habitat. The death at Hoodoo Creek occurred because both black bears and grizzlies were discovering a new feeding environment. At Grizzly Overlook, the black bears strayed straight into the grizzlies' territory. At Dave Adams Hill, both species of bear were searching for a common food source deep in the heart of the forest. But the fourth death changed everything. Winter in Yellowstone. Temperatures of minus 20 degrees are common. Both grizzly bears and black bears were in hibernation. Curled up in burrows or shelters, they might be buried by six meters of snow. But on the very first telemetry flight of the following year, the very first day of tracking for the new season, there was cause for concern. Shannon Podruzny picked up the telltale sound of a bear mortality signal. It was coming from Black Bear 22049, a female aged eight years. She had been collared less than a year before. The coordinates pointed to a place called Pilgrim Creek, just 19 kilometers from the previous death at Dave Adams Hill. This time, Podrizny decided to go in and see for herself. The mortality signal triggers when a bear is stationary for four hours or more. The fact that all of the recorded locations for that collar were at the den suggested that that bear never left that site. As Podrizny neared the site, there was still no movement. The bear's position remained stationary, just where she had last been recorded at the end of the previous autumn. Upon reaching the site, Podrizny found the collar lying on top of a pile of debris. Everywhere she looked, she could see the signs of a struggle. Near the collar were two limbs. The hide was pulled down around the paws. These two legs had been dismembered, skinned, and the flesh eaten, just like at Dave Adams Hill. All of the long bones of the legs were exposed, and there were large chunks of hide and lots of hair. And then a little bit farther away, maybe 10 meters away, we found the other two limbs lying there. Photos from the scene show the legs surrounded by fur that had been ripped from the carcass. But if this was where Black Bear 22049 had bedded down for the winter, where was the den? The area was very torn up, typical of a bear feeding on a carcass. Parts of the carcass were probably cached. The den location may have been covered up or obliterated by the caching behavior and the large pile of debris that it accumulated. It appeared that the den had been destroyed during the struggle. But if this bear hadn't moved all winter, how could they tell if it had been killed at the end of the autumn and preserved by the snow, or if it had been killed at the beginning of the spring? The conclusive evidence came when they found the paws. When we pulled the hide back to look at them, they were still sloughing the outer layer of skin. 
At the end of six months in the den, bears slough off the dead skin that has developed on their pores during hibernation. The old skin just dies off and peels off and it exposes new fresh skin. This paw had those dry patches, and the fact that the dead skin was still evident meant that the bear had never emerged from the den. Her paws still had that old layer clinging to them, but it was coming off. So we assumed that she was still in the den at the time she died. Without a doubt, Black Bear 22049 had been killed very recently. She probably hadn't made it out of the den. Most likely, something had come along and killed her in the den. If the black bear was still in her den, then this was no chance encounter. In spring, male grizzlies emerge from hibernation first. After fasting for five months, they're desperate for food. The grizzly had entered the black bear's territory, then using its keen senses, detected the presence of a black bear at her den site, attacked and killed her. The fight between these two massive predators would have been fast and ferocious. Only one would walk away. A piece of evidence left after the battle confirmed the severity. It would also lead to the perpetrator. While we were looking around the site, we found a claw, a broken off claw from a grizzly bear lying on a log in the middle of the scene. It looked like evidence of a struggle. That claw pretty much told us that, in fact, there probably had to be a fight. Now, for the first time, the team had physical evidence to link them directly to the attacker. Maybe we would catch a bear that was missing a claw. The incriminating evidence that that was the culprit that had killed our black bear. As research continued, the team trapped and collared more grizzly bears near Pilgrim Creek. It was then the Padrizny's team made an unexpected breakthrough. Craig Whitman caught grizzly bear 398 and he was missing the middle claw on his right front paw. The scientists now had a killer, grizzly bear 398. But they would never know if this grizzly was responsible for the previous death just 19 kilometers away. After collaring, 398 was returned to Yellowstone. Monitoring revealed that he did not kill again. The first discovery of an attack by a grizzly on a black bear in Yellowstone confirmed that predation did occur. Now, 15 years later, after three more documented deaths, the scientists had shown predation was part of coexistence. With only about two dozen scientists covering 73,000 square kilometers, there could be many more attacks that no one knows about. But the black bear population in Yellowstone remains relatively secure. There are about five times as many black bears here as there are grizzlies. In fact, the larger, stronger and more aggressive grizzly is the Yellowstone resident under threat. The main reason why bears die in this part of the world, in most parts of the world, is because a human kills it. When bears have to leave the high elevation habitats and they try to come down to lower elevations to seek alternative foods, that brings them directly into contact with people. And that's when we see conflicts. We've documented that between 80 and 90% of all grizzly bear deaths are caused by humans. And that's despite the fact they're protected under the Endangered Species Act.
Yellowstone is not just a park, it's an untamed wilderness in the heart of America. Over the past 60 years, the bears of Yellowstone have become the most studied bears in the world. Events like those at Grizzly Overlook and Hoodoo Creek have given us a much clearer idea of what goes on here. But it is the advances brought by telemetry tracking that mean we now know what the bears are doing, when and where. The mistake this black bear made was venturing out into a large, non-forested area inhabited by a high density of grizzly bears. Attacks like these have probably always happened. But by tracking the bears, we now have a greater insight into how they use this habitat. They overlap to an enormous degree. Mostly the difference in their distribution is in time. In an individual place, the bears seem to know how to avoid each other in most cases. There is scientific proof that these species do attack each other and a better understanding of why. I would guess that in almost all cases, when a grizzly bear kills a black bear, it is for food. No two bears are alike. They have different personalities, I think, much like people have different personalities. I've known some bears that uh, I would consider to be well-adjusted and other bears that I think it would be fair to say were neurotic and some bears that probably could be called psychotic. And I can easily imagine one bear more likely being a killer of bears than another. The four black bear deaths have led the scientific community of Yellowstone to reconsider how their two predators share the backcountry. But there is still far more going on in the wilds of Yellowstone than we know. Thank you.